There's something in my room that cleans my apartment when I'm not there. By Weird Bryce Guy. The first time I came home to find my room cleaned, I thought my roommate had done it. That he had probably made some kind of mess while drunk with friends and had tidied things up. Even going beyond the state of cleanliness I typically left it in. Nothing was missing or broken, so I hadn't said anything. Considering the matter resolved, when it happened a second time, things were a bit more unusual, because not only had the room been thoroughly cleaned, it had also been reorganized. My desk, which normally sits before the windowed wall, perpendicular to my bed, had been moved to the wall opposite to the one against which my bed was placed. Beneath the window was a plant that I hadn't ever seen before, soaking up the sunlight that poured into the room. The carpet had been freshly vacuumed, the wastebasket had been emptied, and my bed sheets had even been switched out. I immediately knew this could not have been the work of my roommate. Even if he weren't notoriously lazy in matters of hygiene and organization, he still couldn't have moved the desk on account of his presently broken arm, a consequence of his drunken adventures. The desk is massive, a gift from my father, who had used it for nearly a decade in his study back at home. It has many compartments in which he had stored his writing tools, small books, and other materials pertinent to his work. The key to these locked drawers had been lost when I moved into the apartment, so many of these objects still remain in the desk, inaccessible. With all that added weight, it would have been impossible for my roommate to move it, unless my roommate had violated the terms of the lease and made a copy of the key for his girlfriend. No one else had access to the apartment, and even if he had, his girlfriend hates me and wouldn't have done something so considerate. Even though logic argued against even the possibility, I asked him if he had cleaned my room, or if he at least knew anything about how it had been cleaned. I've caught him in lies before having become quite adept at catching him in them, as my food often mysteriously disappears from the fridge. So I knew that he was telling the truth when he denied having any knowledge about the incidents. Ironically, he asked me quite sternly if I had given anyone an unsanctioned copy of the key. Since things hadn't yet escalated to being frightening, I decided not to do some paranormal activity style setup with cameras and sensors and all that. I also just couldn't reasonably afford such equipment. The idea of some cleanliness obsessed intruder seemed ridiculous and virtually impossible. Even though I couldn't think of a more plausible explanation, I figured that whatever the cause, the result was only to my benefit. I did decide to try and do better to keep the room clean, so that my unknown benefactor did not have to work so hard to maintain it. Assuming, of course, they were planning to continue. Things became truly unsettling the third time it happened. It was about a week after that previous incident. I had gone to bed late, having been busy with some work I had taken home. I still awoke at my usual time, needing to present the very same work to my supervisors first thing in the morning. I hadn't had time to tidy up the night before, nor in the morning. I'd barely managed to get myself in order before heading out. When I arrived home later that day, the room was clean. Immaculately clean. I've never been in the military, but I imagine that the level of order, alignment, and neatness present within that room would have made a drill sergeant proud. It would have put the best housekeeping services of the most luxurious hotels to shame. It was model-like. 
I felt unclean in comparison, unworthy of entrance, standing at the threshold of that pristine space. Someone, something else, must have felt similarly, because as I took a tentative step into the room, I was suddenly, violently hurled back into the hallway. As I landed, dust was brushed from the shelf by some invisible force, floating away into nothingness. Apparently, there had been one last task to be performed before I was to be allowed entry. I quickly scrambled to my feet, more alarmed than physically shaken. I expected, subconsciously hoped, to see my roommate's grinning face peek around the corner. But no face appeared, and regardless, I'd had a clear view into the room, and would have seen even the slightest instant of corporeal movement. There was nothing visible that could have propelled me backwards. I hadn't tripped or stumbled, hadn't the momentum for any sort of faltering to have occurred. Patently afraid, I betrayed my logical mind and called out into the room. H hello seemed to echo through some grey space, as if the walls had receded to greater dimensions on some other plane, leaving only after images of their original placements. When no one answered, I decided to again try entering the room. I remember then that my roommate wasn't even home, that I was alone with the apparently immaterial presence. I didn't want to leave the room in case the seemingly malevolent entity decided to wreak havoc elsewhere. It wasn't courage that led me to step inside and close the door, but neither was it stupidity. I just wanted, if possible, to ensure that it did not get out. The furniture hadn't been moved again, but some of my posters and personal items had been removed. Pretty much anything that had shown or represented what you might call distasteful, or controversial imagery was absent, or tucked behind more appropriate items. Posters showcasing death metal members or their album covers, video game figurines of monstrous creatures, books whose spines displayed titles pertaining to the horrific, macabre, and occult, all removed or hidden. Who or whatever had cleaned the room had taken special care to eradicate or obfuscate anything that might have made a nun, or an old lady, scowl. The air, which I had somewhat anticipated to be heavy with some spectral residue, was surprisingly light and breathable, as if the atmosphere too had been sanitized. It was paradoxically both calming and terrifying, physically refreshing, but psychologically unsettling. The force or entity had already shown itself to be capable of physical violence, and while it hadn't acted again, the possibility that I was powerless to defend myself did not by even the slightest measure assuage my fright. I was knocked out of my terror-induced contemplations by the collision of a small object against my forehead. It hadn't hurt much so I wasn't immediately sent cowering to a corner. I looked and found the item, and picked it up. It was a key, a very old one, with an inscription on its face that had faded to illegibility long ago. The only thing in the room to which it might have belonged to was my father's old desk. Cautiously, feeling the gaze of some unseen observer upon me, I walked to the desk and inserted the key into the topmost drawer. As I had suspected, it was a perfect fit. There were old pens and large books with time yellowed pages within the drawer. Unlocking several more drawers, I found items of similar use in antiquity. I left these where I had found them, not wanting to get a single speck of dust anywhere on the freshly polished surface of the desk. All that remained to be unlocked was the right-sized lowest drawer, the largest of them all. I unlocked and opened the compartment, and found something wholly unlike the others inside. It was a vase, darkly colored as if sculpted in obsidian, 
but made of porcelain. It was capped by a small knob, also porcelain, with remnants of some sort of wax sealant ringed at intervals around its rim. There were no markings or embellishments that could be seen on the body of the vessel, but the structure and craftsmanship nonetheless suggested it was of high value, financially or culturally. I placed it on the desk, handling it with delicate care that I hadn't consciously thought to employ. It had what can best be described as a funeral air, and I guessed at the contents, feeling them gently toss about within the vase. In that moment I had forgotten, or perhaps was made to forget, the shocking supernatural happenings of only moments before. A morbid curiosity had taken hold of my mind, and urged by a powerful, though unknown impetus, I picked away the sealant and removed the cap. As if it had been pressed inside the cap, something within surged upwards, propelling me back. The source of the eruption was invisible, but the pressure was undeniably tangible. I was knocked to the floor by a force even greater than the one that had pushed me into the hall. I feebly climbed onto my bed. The wind knocked out of me. The vase, despite the sudden interruption, hadn't moved from its place on the desk. Whatever had poured forth from within had done so without even making the thing wobble. I sat there, both amazed and horrified, as the imperceptible force then became partially visible. A wavering, translucent form in the shape of a person. Though it stood over me, it was apparently rather short, and I knew that if I stood, I'd be at least a foot taller. But I was totally subdued by fear, and it might as well have been the phantom of some titan standing over me. Finally, dear lord, now you listen here. I didn't spend the better part of my youth teaching my son how to take care of himself, only for him to squander that knowledge and allow his son to live like this. I know you're an adult, and you can do what you want, but that doesn't mean you should live in squalor. Your father managed to learn eventually. I expect you to as well. I never want to see this room in this state it was ever again. Do you understand me? I nodded, utterly perplexed by the specter's heated lecture, unsure of how else to respond. Good. I don't want to see any of that filth around here. How do you expect the nice young woman over with all those satanic images and horrible plastic men around? I won't have my grandson becoming some kind of punk. Now, give grandma a kiss. And then the familiarity of that voice hit me. Even with the slightly ghostly intonation, the voice was plainly that of my grandmother's, and her unique outline was vaguely apparent in the apparition as well. Still, fear hadn't yet left me, because my grandmother was dead, and up until that point, I hadn't believed in life after death at all. But it was undeniable. My grandmother, some spiritual manifestation of her, had just chastised me on my sloppiness. Well? I perceived the image had drawn closer, and remembered that she had demanded a kiss. I fought through the terror that stiffened my body, and leaned forward with lips pursed. A moment later, something smooth, yet cold, like a cheek that had been without the warmth of life for quite some time, touched my lips. I withdrew a moment later, the action completed, and stared fearfully at the ghostly figure, who seemed satisfied. Now, if it wouldn't inconvenience you. Would you mind driving Grammy to your father's house? It's obvious that in his uncourageable forgetfulness, he failed to perform the one thing I asked him to do, once I met my end. I told him to scatter my ashes throughout my garden, where I've buried so many of my furry children over the years, and where I've planted so many beautiful things. Take me to him, so I can remind him of the promise he made his frail and dying mother all those weeks ago. 
There was an almost imperceptible snicker that followed the latter part of her speech. I obviously had so many questions regarding the afterlife and her, obviously stubborn, spiritual persistence. But she dismissed them all and demanded that I take her to my dad without delay. Unable to argue, I picked up the vase and she returned therein just as violently as she had left it. And just as I had driven her to the pharmacy or the grocery store during our life, I drove her vase-bound spirit to my dad's house. Along the way, she criticized my driving, saying that I drove like a rock star tour bus driver. We arrived, and she quieted up as I strode across the front lawn. I knocked, and my dad answered a few moments later. I immediately put the vase into his arms and said that I had found it in the desk. His surprise at my sudden visit quickly turned to shock at seeing the vase. And then, that gave way to deep remorse upon remembering what he had vowed to do. I patted him on the shoulder and quickly turned away, almost jogging to my car. I took one last glance before pulling out of the driveway, smiling to myself as my father tentatively removed the cap from the vase. Some Pals Chilling in Your House at Night A Bedtime Story for Adults Written by Glass When you shut your eyes, does the world around you still exist? The only correct answer to this question is, obviously. What should concern you is whether or not it exists in the way you've been perceiving it. Not everyone is as outgoing as you are. Some creatures are very shy indeed. They want to get to know you and help you out. But they aren't so certain you'd be receptive to their whole deal. So they wait until the darkness falls and your breathing becomes soft and regular before they emerge. I'm going to introduce you to three of them now. It's natural to be nervous meeting new people. But these three already think you're just swell. So don't stress out about it. The first one you may already be a little familiar with. They are certainly the most outgoing of the three. If you've ever tossed and turned on your pillow, your mind a churning hellscape of bad memories and future anxieties, Hush has most certainly been by your side. They are a creature of the quiet, they do not make a sound. Not ever. They can sense restlessness like a shark scenting blood in the water. And like a shark, they rush over to investigate. Unlike a shark, however, Hush will never bite check your vibe. They will simply lean over you a very little bit, concerned, and reach out a hand and very, very gently touch your head. All at once, these racing thoughts have stopped dead in their tracks. The music has ceased looping. The stress has receded. Hush has made your mind quiet and settled. The peace hits you immediately like a weighted blanket. Unfortunately, the side effect of this is that you are suddenly very prone to sleep paralysis. Hush does not know about sleep paralysis and they would certainly never try to make it worse. If your mind's eye opens and looks up, you may barely make out a face with empty eyes, and the mouth a tightly and very neatly sewn seam of black thread. Hush has been focusing on you, leaving you free, under these odd and unlikely circumstances to perceive their face. It is possible at this point for a surge of fear to break their connection with you. Should you reawaken, Hush will be hidden away. They certainly didn't mean to scare you. Hush is a very gentle being. They are an excellent friend and pal to have within your house at night. The next time you feel sleep hit you like a sack of bricks after hours of tossing and turning, 
Take a moment as your consciousness fades to thank Hush for being so nice to you. I'm sure that they will appreciate it. Our very next cool dude is Hello. He thinks you're just adorable. And when you get up in the dark, he can't help but follow you around a little. He doesn't follow you into the bathroom. He has enough of a grasp on privacy to know not to do that. And at heart, he is a gentleman. As you mosey to and from your bed, picking your way carefully in the dark, he is just behind, leaning over you. He is very tall, you see, and drinking in all the charming noises you make when you are sleepy and bleary. He likes the way you move about. He thinks you're such a funny little guy. It's not very easy for him to move around all folded up inside your house. He's putting in a special effort. Most of the time, he's sitting on your floor, stretched out a bit, reading your books, or trying to imagine what it's like for you to cook in your tiny kitchen. He'll go in every once in a while and check on you as you sleep. Your peaceful face is almost magnetic. Everybody looks so sweet and charming when they sleep. He never lingers to stare, though, because he doesn't want to cause you nightmares. The next time you're making your way back to your bed, and you sense something moving around in the dark, don't turn around. Hello is a lot to take in all at once, especially if you're not expecting him. And frightening you really would make him feel very bad. Hello has such a soft heart. Finally, we have our last and least familiar nighttime visitor. Who's there? She's more interested in your stuff than you. It's not that she's superficial. She's just extremely curious. She wants to know what all of your cupboards and boxes contain, and how all of your neat little gadgets work. She's very sensitive to texture. With her large hands and long, tapering fingers, she loves to explore the endless array available in your home. She feels differences that we will never notice. For example, she can stroke the keys on your keyboard and know which letters you like best. She's very grateful to you for letting her explore your home and the wonderful things inside of it. She's always very careful with the objects she handles and make sure to put them back exactly as she found them. Accidents do happen, however, and this is why who's there will probably be the one to, accidentally, scare you the most. Every once in a while, something will slip out of her long fingers and fall over, or land on your floor. She stands very still while you rush out to investigate, wondering how you know it's her if you can't seem to see her. When you go back and fall asleep again, she's twice as careful as she was before. Because she's heard that sleep is very important to humans, and she feels bad for interrupting it. However, who's there has been known to cause accidents on purpose, but only when she thinks another human being is trying to get in. She knows that only the sleeping humans belong. So if another one comes creeping along ever so stealthily, she will, oops, knock something over that just happens to make a racket, and give you a better chance to make this new human go away, after they leave of their own accord. Who's there really does want a good life for you, and although she can be a little clumsy at times and make you afraid, she really tries to make up for it by keeping you safe. Hush, Hello, and Who's There always travel together. Sometimes they get in one another's way, but they never fight. They are very companionable and even-tempered. Just the kind of visitors you might want in your house, I think. They've really enjoyed visiting you and learning about you. They really like you a lot. I hope you can rest easier and feel less lonely, knowing that these good friends are around watching over you, and wishing you the best. Ah.
I'm not quite sure what that last story is supposed to make me feel. Is that sort of thing really what you humans find comforting? Anyways, thank you very much to my very special guest M. Frightmare for doing a fantastic job in her role as a dead grandmother. She really did a fantastic job. She also has her own channel, where she writes her own horror stories and narrates them as well. If you want to see more of her content, her links will be below. Now if you liked these stories, please leave a like, comment, and if you're new here, subscribe and ring the bell for all future notifications. Because we can't have you missing any of my future content now, can we? Every episode does also get uploaded to the Silver Threads podcast if you do prefer content of the audio variety. If you need to contact me for business purposes, please email storiesforsilverthreads at gmail.com. I'll see you next time with another story.